Good evening. Please have a seat. What an amazing blessing. This could only happen in a Catholic church, that we come together in the presence of the Lord and Savior. What a great gift it is for us to be able to be here in his most powerful presence. And we are grateful to be able to complete our Lenten retreat together as we sit here and recognize the great gift of God's grace, his presence, his mercy in our lives. And so tonight, um, what I'd like to do is to spend a few minutes talking about where we've been so that we can talk about where we're going. One of the things that I shared with you early on was that this is really a retreat in three parts. The first one was understanding mercy and recognizing God's divine mercy, his great gift to us of mercy. That's receiving mercy. And yesterday we went through and really began to understand in a deeper level than we normally do what it means to share mercy. And we took a look at the 14 works of mercy, seven corporal, seven spiritual. And I actually had the pleasure today of recording all the notes that I put on the flip chart. And I continue to be amazed at both the uh, afternoon and the evening session at how wonderful it was and how beautiful it was, the, the insights that you, that you shared. And so uh, Greg Smith is on vacation. When he comes back, those will be actually up on the website, along with countless specialists who we're going to pray for this evening. So it's a, an important part of our rich tradition as Catholics to recognize the gifts and the guidance that the church gives us and what a really wonderful opportunity we have to go deeper into our faith to really more profoundly understand mercy. And tonight, we're not going to talk about receiving mercy. We're not going to talk about sharing mercy as an activity or an event. We're going to talk about being mercy. Not merciful, being mercy. Living our lives from that perspective of mercy. And one of the things that was really a great gift to me, Father Leon I'm going to say last April, and maybe it was May, asked me if I would do this retreat. And so since then, I've really been studying the nature of mercy, and what a phenomenal 
view in to the faith when we look through that lens of mercy. A lot of things that we may have questions about, the lens of mercy helps us to better understand it. And I will tell you this, that as we, as Catholics, even practicing Catholics, people that are committed, that are devout, we have questions, don't we, about our faith. We wonder how things work, or we don't agree always with what the church teaches, preaches, and proclaims. But I will ask you to do this. Come with the assumption that the church is right. Because none of us, none of us, is as wise as 2,000 years of church. There are people who dedicated their lives to help uncover and discover the very essence of the truths that we teach and believe. So assume that the church is right, and then go and understand why. Because that's the power of our faith. That's the power that we have as Catholics. 2,000 years of rich tradition, led by Christ, guided by the Holy Spirit. Seriously, how do we go wrong? How do we go wrong? So as we tonight talk about, explore what it means to actually be mercy, I want you to come from that perspective, that the gifts that you've got as Catholics is powerful, is insightful, and is designed to guide each one of us back to the Heavenly Father. That's what this is all about. And as you know, I keep telling you, I know, but I will continue to tell you, Matthew 25, 31 to 46, right? Read it. Recognize the message that is in that passage. Everything comes back to mercy. And we'll talk about it again. Everything comes back to mercy. That key that unlocks the kingdom is the key of mercy. So, before we get too much further, let's talk about where we've been. There are a few things that uh, we talked about on Monday and some good insights that we got from yesterday that I'd like to just spend a few minutes recovering or rediscovering with you. First of all, the understanding that in all things we should be looking for the most loving option. In all things, looking for the most loving option. You know, we have so many choices in our lives, and it's not the big things that I'm even talking about. It's those little things. It's how you respond to somebody who slights you or insults you. It's those little irritations that happen every day. How do you respond? Being mercy. How do you respond? And one of the things we talked about, again, the four different types of mercy, right? Right? Compassion, generosity, forgiveness, gratitude. And we talked about the fact that if you want to do an examination of conscience, one of the most powerful ways you can do it is by going through those four types of mercy. What were the opportunities that I had today to be mercy? And how well did I do? Incidentally, it's important to recognize when you do well as much as when we fall down. You know, as Catholics, we look at confession, we think we got to be focused on all the times that we fail. It's just as important, maybe more important, to recognize the times when we did it right, when we really were mercy to somebody, and pay attention and recognize that. Because the more you pay attention to mercy, the more you focus on mercy, the more merciful you'll be. It will happen. And that's the great gift that we have. We have to focus, we have to pay attention, but that's why that mercy-based examination of conscience is such a wonderful opportunity for us. And as we talked about Monday or Tuesday, we talked about the fact that you know, so often we go to confession, we confess the same sins. I guarantee you that if you come through the lens of mercy, that will happen less often. I'm not saying it'll never happen, but it'll happen less often. And you'll recognize those opportunities, those unique opportunities in your life to be the miracle. You know, this is where this whole thing started, wasn't it? On Saturday and Sunday in my homily, I talked about being the miracle. What does that mean? That means being mercy. 
to those people in your life. And so, let me also remind you, write the letter. Write the letter. Let me tell you something about what science teaches about action. This is truth, you can look it up. There's something called the butterfly effect. And essentially it says that some little event halfway across the world can have a profound effect later on. That's exactly how mercy works in the world. That little thank you, that little acknowledgement can touch people's hearts in unique and powerful ways. Your letter will have an effect far beyond you and the person you're writing it to. You won't even know how important and how much impact that letter will have. And if we're going to really be people of mercy, is it really too much to ask to tell somebody that they're forgiven or that you're sorry or that they're important to you or that they touched your life in a special way or that you love them or you miss them? And it can be, as I said, people that you know or people that you don't know, frankly. And this probably won't surprise you. I'm writing mine to the pink nuns. I want to let them know. Because I went on their website, incidentally, and I love this, they only take letters. They don't take emails. You can't fill out a form online. There's no way to do that. But they say, please understand that we can't respond to every letter we get because we get so many of them, so many prayer requests that we get. And I'm thinking, how many times do they hear thank you for your ministry? How many times do they hear what a great gift you are? Not just to me, but to the world that you're praying for. And I'm picking on the pink nuns just because just I happen to think it's amazing that they spent the last hundred years in perpetual adoration. But, but to everyone, how many people in your lives should we be saying thank you to? Just thank you for the things that they do, for the ministry that they offer. And how often does that happen? We have lots of letters to write. As of this afternoon, I think I have about 15 of them. But you know that we're going to continue to collect them. I get that it's going to take some time for you to think about it, Think about who you want to send to. Think about what you want to say. But don't, please, don't that, let this Lent slip by without writing at least one. Please, don't let this Lent slip by. You want to be people of mercy? That's a great place to start. Yesterday, I got to tell you, mixed reviews about yesterday. Some people really got into it and loved it. Some people didn't. But I have to tell you, as I was typing up your answers, I honestly was blown away. There were some phenomenal answers to the questions that we talked about yesterday about those works of mercy in both groups. And I was so impressed with the depth of the thinking and the discussion, and it was an amazing thing. And, and you'll have that resource sometime next week. But what a beautiful gift, and I encourage you to take a look at those 14 works of mercy. Because our church teaches us that we need to be really active in the world. We need to move the world. And we do that through the lever of mercy. And how awesome could it be that each one of us can make a difference in the world by being those people of mercy? And as we know, Mercy is that key, as I said earlier, to heaven. So we understand how important it is. We understand that it's desperately needed in the world. And we're so often looking for solutions to drugs and violence and, you know, all kinds of chaos in the world, and legitimately so. The answer is always mercy. The answer is always mercy, proactive mercy us making the first move. You see, Christ taught us by making the first move on the cross that we have to go first. We have to show the way. We have to reach out. We have to be the people 
of the presence of Christ in the world. And that's what mercy is all about. And so we recognize that we can receive it, that Christ so wants to give us his mercy. He loves us so much. He wants to just fill us with his mercy. And you know, the challenge that we have, honestly, is that we get too addicted, for want of a better term, to our eyes and our ears. They're not the best vehicles we have. You see, our heart is the best vehicle we have for seeing and for listening. And I'm not talking about the thing that's pumping blood. I'm talking about the core essence of who you are, at the very center of who you are. Christ wants to touch you there. He wants to see you there. He wants you to hear him there. So that we can have this gift of confidence. Because mercy begins with something that is, for all of us, I believe, most of us, a challenge. And that is humility. Humility is the cornerstone, the anchor. And next to humility is trust. And look what happens. We look at the image of divine mercy, and what's the signature? Jesus, I trust in you. And Monday night, we sign the card saying, yes, I really do trust. I really do trust. Well, we're going to talk about trust in a few minutes. Do we really trust? Do we really trust? And so as the foundation, you know, the first two nights are about laying the foundation for what we're going to talk about tonight, which is being mercy. And the, the first aspect of being mercy is really understanding the nature of prayer. Um, first of all, let me reiterate what I said the other night about prayer. You can't do it wrong, but you can do it better. You can't do it wrong, but you can do it better. And as I told the afternoon group, I'm a little bit embarrassed to tell you the source of this idea that I'm about to share with you, because it was some sitcom that I watched, but it was about this woman who was in some little chapel somewhere, and she was praying intensely, she really needed God to do some things, and she was praying intensely. And all of a sudden, somebody showed up and said, so what are you doing? She said, I'm praying. Who are you praying to? Well, God, of course. Who's God? Who's God? Well, he's the almighty. He's the creator. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He is the great God the greatest being in the entire creation. He said, hmm, let me get this straight. You're praying to God, who is all-knowing, all-powerful, who created everything, greatest being in the world, and you're telling him what to do. So, what's a better way to pray? Here's the key. Who's got the ball? See, whoever gets the ball, you know, on the playground, whoever brings the ball makes the rules, right? Because if you don't play by their rules, they take the ball and go home, right? So in prayer, we talk about who's got the ball. Now, if you want to keep the ball, then you make the rules. You can do what you want when you want to do it. But if you want to give God the ball, you're being God for just a moment, okay? Just <laughs> God usually doesn't throw it back, but okay. <laughs> but if you give God the ball, then you have to know his way, his time. Now, there are times when we really want to give the ball to God. We really want him to have it, okay? And then we wait. Hmm. Hmm, he's not doing anything. So we get a little bit closer. Hmm, hmm, well, hmm, well, okay, I'll take it back. I'll do it myself, right? And we take the ball back. Now what happens when we take the ball back? Do we get to do it our own way? We do. 
Do we get to do it in our own time? We do. Do we usually mess it up? We do, right? So why is it that we take the ball back? There is one reason we take the ball back. Because we don't trust. We do not trust. Oh, sure, we can pray in front of the divine mercy image. We can say, Jesus, I trust in you. But when push comes to shove, when it's really important, when stuff's really on the line, do we actually trust? Holy mackerel. What a beautiful insight that is. How do we develop, how do we deepen our trust? How do we give God the ball and say, keep it, I'm not coming back for it. I'm giving this to you. It's a very difficult thing to do. Because there's a part two to this whole thing, you see. And part two is discerning God's will in your life. What does he want you to do? You see, that's another part of prayer, is being so in sync with God that you know in your heart what he's calling you to do. And many of you, because you've told me over these last three days, have had experiences where you know God has told you to do something, let go of something, or go and do something, or have a conversation, or write a letter. You know that God's touched your heart. And here's the point. There are some times, in fact, we get it wrong. We think we're doing the right thing. We go with best of intention, and we do it wrong. Because you know what? We're human. We're fallible. We will do things wrong. But here's the point. Even when it's done wrong, God somehow brings goodness out of it. And let me give you the greatest example of that that we have in the whole history of history. God was able to take the betrayal, the torture, the crucifixion, the execution of his son, and turn it into the salvation of the world. If he can do that seriously, how badly can you screw up relative to that? If he can work with that, he can work with anything. And sometimes we just got to say, Lord, take my screw ups and make it be okay and trust that he will. See, we're fallible. God is outside of time and space. We're square smack dab in it. Our bodies are finite. They end. God doesn't end. We're square in time. God's outside of time. God's everywhere. We can only be in one place at one time. This is the power of our God. And for us to be able to actually take that leap of faith, that leap of faith, that is trust. The ability to trust our God and to believe that he'll be there to catch us. And to recognize even more than that, or I should say beyond that, that everything that happens in our lives, whether we like it or not, whether it's enjoyable or not, whether it's pleasurable or not, whether it's painful or it creates suffering, is all part of that unique journey that each one of us is on. You know, we come here together we come as community, and yesterday we talked about the importance of being a community of faith, being a community of mercy. But we recognize that each one of us, while we're traveling together, is on a different path. And each one of us has different sufferings, different challenges, different joys. And it's all part of that unique journey that God has created specifically for you. Nobody else has your journey. Because you are special. You are incredibly loved. You are so unique. And God loves you so much that not only did he die for you, but he gave you this life to live so that you can rejoin him in heaven. And you know what? We're human, which means we will never by ourselves be good enough. But that price has already been paid. The catechism tells us that Jesus paid a price he didn't know, because we owed a price we couldn't pay. You are already loved. In fact, I can even tell you, you are already saved. But you do, because of free will, get the choice to say, no thanks, rather not be saved. Thank you very much for the offer. But each one of us here 
is loved in a unique way. Which, honest to goodness, is why abortion is such a heinous sin. Because those are human beings that were created by God that had their own path. That had their own journey. And God loved them just as much as he loves each one of us. And what a horrendous thing to do to cut that life before it begins, or before it enters the world. So, prayer. I'd like to take a few minutes and spend some time talking about how to pray a very special and powerful prayer. And before I do that, let me just say, look, there's lots of forms of prayer, right? There are formal prayers, Our Father, Hail Mary, Glory Be, the Rosary, the Chaplet, the Mass. We can do formal prayer, we can do informal prayer, but the point of prayer is to discern what God wants from us, what he's calling us to do, that special mission that he's calling us, that special action that he wants us to take, to touch not only our lives, but other people's lives, and recognize the power of us being the people of God and that presence we can have in the world. But I'd like to talk to you tonight and share with you a very powerful prayer. It's a prayer you all know like the back of your hand. But I'm going to suggest to you that there's a difference between saying it and praying it. And I'm talking about the Our Father. Now, when we come to Mass we get into what I call church rhythm. See if you recognize it. Blah, blah. Blah, 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 blah. Blah, 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 blah. Right? I could be saying anything, you know the rhythm. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I remember, and I'll talk about me specifically, I remember being in the pew and not even realizing that we were saying our Father until I was shaking somebody's hand at the sign of peace. And as I took the time to actually study the Our Father, it just dawned on me that this is the prayer that Christ taught the apostles when they said, teach us how to pray. There must be some power and substance to this prayer. And so tonight I'd like to share that with you. And hopefully you will never, ever say the Our Father ever again. But you'll always pray it, even at Mass. Now I will tell you something. Kathy Kempf is here. She's from Our Lady of Pompeii, so she can verify if you think I'm not telling you the truth. At St. Greg's, on the altar, we hold hands. At Pompeii, we don't. For me, it's very helpful to use gestures to say the Our Father, it helps me remember that I'm actually praying the prayer, not just saying it. So I'm going to share with you my gestures that I use every time I say the Our Father, whether I'm on the altar, whether I'm at home, whenever I say the Our Father. And I'll explain you why I do them. The first thing is, and recognize, the great gift that Jesus gives us, one of many, is he changes our relationship from creator, rule giver, and punisher to father. In fact, honestly, more than father, daddy. That close, intimate relationship. We have that relationship through Jesus' sacrifice. So when we start the Our Father, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven. My gesture was taught to me by my grandson. Because I will tell you, there is nothing more awesome as a grandfather than to have your two-year-old little grandson see you and come running with his arms outstretched so that you can pick him up and hug him and kiss him and love him. That's how I start the Our Father. Our Father who art in heaven. I want to raise my hands because I want God to know I love him just like my grandson loves me and I know that he loves me that way back. Take me, hold me, keep me in your arms. Our Father who art in heaven. And then I broaden them a little bit to recognize the greatness of God's name. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. It's a weird word. 
But let me tell you, it's a word that we use often. October 31st is called Halloween. It's All Hallows Eve. That's where it came from. What's the next day? All Saints Day. Hallowed, holy, blessed. And the importance of name throughout, throughout salvation history, we see key people in salvation history getting their names changed to reflect their new role. We just heard a couple weeks ago, didn't we? Abram, the father of the clan, becomes Abraham, the father of the nation. We know that Simon was named, renamed Peter, the rock. Saul becomes Paul. In recognition of the change of the conversion, not the same person. And there was great power in knowing someone's name. And so, actually, at daily mass, we heard the story of Moses and the burning bush. And he asked God, so what name shall I tell the Israelites? And he says, I am who am, Yahweh. But the Jews will never use Yahweh. They take out the vowels because you can't speak the name of God. And pull out your Bibles and take a look. Wherever the name Lord is, you'll notice it's in a different type. It's in all capitals. The L is a big capital. The O-R-D is a small capital. Check it out. Because that's a special name. It's a special recognition. And the fact that Jesus allows us to call God Father, that that is his name, that we are allowed to call him, changes everything for us. And it is not something we should take lightly. The next part, thy kingdom come. Well, let's think about it. If we're going to change the world, and I am not using that term lightly, but mercy will change the world, and it'll start with us, not only as individuals, but also as community. But where does it need to start? Thy kingdom come first here in my heart. I can't give what I don't have. I need to share, I need to receive that mercy, that love, that kingdom of greatness that God wants to give each one of us. So the next gesture is, thy kingdom come, and then thy will be done. For me, I use the old Roman gesture of a salute. That is, I will do it. I will follow your command, which is beating the breast. Thy will be done, beating the breast. I will do your will. I will do the best that I can. Now that's a big, big obligation, because that means we really have to discern what God's will for us is. And it's no mystery, it's just work. It's prayerful work to be able to, dis to discern what God's will is for our life. Then we get in to the requests. And we get the first of the requests. On earth as it is in heaven. Okay. Got a little test for you, gonna put a little pressure on you. The afternoon group got it without a problem. If things are working as well on earth as they are in heaven, what would we have? Yes! Good, very well done, peace, okay. All right, see, they told me they were much smarter than you. I, that's not true, actually, as it turns out. That's very good. So the, the, next, the first request, then, is for peace. Peace within me, peace within my family, my community, my world, our world. Think about what would happen if all we did was spread peace. Give us this day our daily bread. I used to make this part of the Our Father. I used to focus on abundance. But I've changed that. And I, I focused on abundance because of John 10.10, 10, which said, I came that you may have life and have it abundantly. So I thought abundance was the right thing. But I've especially in the United States, I've changed that. Not to abundance, but to enough. I don't need more than I need. But I need what I need. I need enough. I need enough. 
And that's what I pray for, for enough. And forgive us our trespasses. This one, pretty straightforward. Forgiveness. I'm asking our Lord for forgiveness for what I've done, for what I've failed to do, for the times that I've failed to be merciful. Forgiveness. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, I know that there are people who say that that phrase, that part of the prayer, makes the Our Father a very scary prayer. Honestly, I disagree. Because at that part of the prayer, to me, is a prayer for mercy. Lord, make me as merciful as I can possibly be. Let me treat everyone in my life, regardless of whether they've offended me or not, let me treat them the way you would want me to treat them, the way you would treat them. Teach me to be merciful. And lead us not into temptation. Guidance. Guidance. But deliver us from evil. Protection. Amen. And so after we acknowledge our love for God and we show our great respect for his name, we ask for peace, for enough, for forgiveness, for mercy, for guidance, and for protection. Seriously, what else do you need? Perfect prayer. That's why Jesus taught it to us. And that's why we can't ever say that word or that prayer casually. We can't just say the words because we know them so well. Because we miss the opportunity to pray the prayer that is the perfect prayer. Where we ask our God who loves us so much and who we have acknowledged we love as well for everything that we need. How can we miss that opportunity? Whether we're saying the chaplet, whether we're praying it at Mass, whether we're saying a rosary, or whether we're just going to sleep at night and saying, and our Father. Never, ever say that prayer without meaning it. Speaking of prayers, one of the things that we're going to do in just a few minutes is we're going to pray the chaplet. And uh, Paul, is Katie here? Katie, can you get the sheets out, the chaplet sheets? They're out? Amazing. You are amazing. Okay. So we're going to pray the chaplet together, and Daniel's going to lead us in song. I'm going to ask that we take our time with this prayer. Uh, we are actually the first prayer after the sign of the cross, which we're also recognized as the prayer of our faith. So we're not going to take that casually either. And we're going to say the chaplet together. And you can either stay seated or you can kneel down, whichever you'd prefer to do. And so we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, 
now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. In atonement for our sins and those of the Or somebody different. So, the first decade is for the Pink Sisters. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood, soul and divinity. On this next decade, we're going to play for all the specialists of mercy that we identified last uh, yesterday. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, 
have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. This next decade is for clergy and religious. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Have for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer you the body and blood and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. This next decade is for all those who are suffering in any way in the world, for those who were born today, and for those who will die today. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion. Have mercy on us and on the whole world for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father. I offer you the body and blood, 
soul and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. This last decade is for the faith community at St. Gregory the Great. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. I uh, keep forgetting. Did everyone get a copy of the plenary indulgence sheet? Okay. So what I'd like to do right now <clears throat> is to, again, talk about yet another great gift of our faith, and that is indulgences, specifically a plenary indulgence. Let me explain what a plenary indulgence is. A plenary indulgence, there are two aspects to forgiveness of sin. One is to ask and receive forgiveness. That's part one. If that's not everything. The second part is that we have to make reparations for the damage that our sins did. That's part two. Let me give you an example. If I'm playing ball outside your house and I throw the ball through your window, I can knock on your door and say, I am so sorry for breaking your window. And you could say, I know it was an accident, you're forgiven. It doesn't fix the window. When we go to confession, we still have to fix the windows. And the place that we fix the windows if they're not fixed before we die is called purgatory. purgatory. Exactly. 
A plenary indulgence fixes all the windows. So it is an amazing gift that Christ gave the church to give us these plenary indulgences. And there are many ways, which we're going to discuss in a few minutes, that we can receive this plenary indulgence. There are a couple rules about plenary indulgences. You can offer them up for anyone who has died. And you can offer it for yourself, but no one else who's living. So it's people who have died or yourself. And oh, by the way, it is not selfish to do a plenary indulgence for yourself. Now, every plenary indulgence, regardless of what the act is, has four things that we have to do. No matter what they are, these four things always have to be done. Number one, communion on the day of the act of indulgence. You have to go to communion that day. Number two, you have to go to confession eight days before or eight days after. Eight days before or eight days after. Number three, you have to be free from any attraction to sin, even venial sin, which of course confession helps us with. And number four is we have to pray for the intention of the Holy Father for that month. Every month the Father, Holy Father has a different intention. You don't actually have to know what it is, you can just offer a Hail Mary for his intention, and, and that, that will work. And then there are the acts. We're going to go through these. These are specific to Lent. So these are things that we can do right now that get us this complete freedom. I will tell you that in my family, we actually have a list of people that we do plenary indulgences for. Now, there are questions about plenary indulgence like, what happens if you offer a plenary indulgence and they're already in heaven? Look at plenary indulgences never get wasted. God will use it appropriately, so don't ever worry about that. The other thing is that we make sure that as we do these plenary indulgences that we recognize the great gift that, that we're giving to, to the people that are in purgatory. Because purgatory is a really nasty place. Now, the good news about purgatory is you're not going to hell. So, good news. Bad news is you can't do anything to get out of it yourself other than suffer. And so, we talk about the communion of saints, right? The communion of saints have three parts, right? The church triumphant, which are the saints. The church suffering, which are the people in purgatory. And the church militant, which is you and me, right? We can help the people in purgatory. And once they get to heaven, they can help us if we go to purgatory. So, let's talk about the different plenary indulgences. The first one, interestingly enough, an adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. You are so lucky in this parish to have perpetual adoration. Spectacular. So, when this is done for at least a half hour, you get a plenary indulgence. Again, you still got to do the four things. Go to Mass, go to Confession, be free of sin, and... I pray for the Holy Father, but a half hour, so, oh, by the way, tonight counts. Uh, the next one is adoration of the cross, and this happens, you know, the three o'clock service that you have for, on Good Friday, and you do the adoration of the cross, plenary indulgence. Uh, prayer before a crucifix, that's the prayer that you have to say on any Friday during Lent, any crucifix that you've got. Recitation of the rosary. When the rosary is said, oh, I love this, in a church or an oratory or as a family or a community. So here's a cool thing, okay? The Smagalas up here in front, they say the rosary, seven plenary indulgences. Well, no, you haven't received First Communion, right, Cecilia? No, not yet. Okay, well, you know, five out of seven. Um, reading sacred scripture for a half hour, plenary indulgence. Stations of the cross, plenary indulgence. Done with real stations of the cross, which, of course, you have here. Um, secret past imagination. I have to be honest with you, I'd never heard of that one before, but that's the prayer. And if you say it on Holy Thursday, after the Mass of the Lord's Supper, boom, plenary indulgence. And then, my all-time favorite, 
is Divine Mercy Sunday. If you go to Divine Mercy Sunday, I call it Saint Maker Sunday. Because if you go to Divine Mercy, you, know, you go to Mass, good, and then you go to the service. Father, we've got the service, right? We're going to have confessions, right? Okay? So you get confession, you get the Eucharist because you went to Mass, you go to that service, boom, plenary indulgence. Now, let's just talk a minute about the power of Divine Mercy Sunday as a plenary indulgence. We recognize the gift that we receive in this amazing gift of divine mercy. And let me tell you the story of my first divine mercy. It was the first divine mercy. I happened to be at London in the time, and the church that we went to, because all churches in Europe are huge, I was at this church. In fact, I was there for the Easter vigil, and the priest sang the whole thing. It was an amazing it was an amazing Mass. And so I, I didn't even know what Divine Mercy was. But I was in London. I didn't really have anything to do. So I said, well, let's check it out. And hey, they had confession, so not a bad deal. So I got there. The service started at 3, Hour of Mercy. So I got there at noon. The place was packed. I, I, I couldn't tell you. There had to be thousands of people in this church. It was packed. I waited in line for confession for three hours. I never got there. There were so many people. But it, to me, opened my eyes to what this great gift of mercy was. And I studied it more, and I understood it better, and I recognized this amazing gift that we had in divine mercy. Such an amazing gift. So please, if you don't, haven't made it a practice to go to divine mercy, celebration, the Sunday after Easter, make it, a, make it part of your, just the way you live your Catholic faith. It is an unbelievable gift. And on top of it, you got all these other ways to receive plenary indulgences. So there's a lot of people you can get out of purgatory. I've not been there myself, but I hear it's not a place you want to stay long. Okay. The next thing I'd like to do is to share with you, as I've, we dedicated this entire retreat to the Blessed Mother, of course for the intention of the Pink Sisters, but we dedicated this time to the Blessed Mother. In our church, the Blessed Mother is the first and greatest of all the saints. There are more churches dedicated to Mary than to any other saint. Understand, Mary is a saint. She is not the fourth member of the Blessed Trinity. She is not God. But let me tell you the role that Mary plays, because it was the role that she was given at the foot of the cross when Jesus gave her, her to John, and therefore gave it to the church, and therefore gave her to us. She is the role of mother. Now, I'm going to divide you into two groups, moms and sons. So, be a little boy, I don't know, five, six, Stevie's age. Okay, you got a little mustard here. What does mom do? Licks it, make it, because she's not going to let you go out anything less than perfect looking, right? Okay, because that's what moms do. Mary does the same thing. Mary is not an intermediary between us and Christ. But what Mary does is she magnifies and she perfects our, our prayers. Now let me explain. Here's the image that I use. It works for me. I hope it works for you. But our prayers are like a stream of white light. And Mary is a prism. And that light of our prayers hits her and it bursts into all the colors of the rainbow and spreads out across the entire horizon because she magnifies and she perfects our prayers. She doesn't stand between us and God, but she makes sure that every prayer is perfect before it gets to the ears of God. She is the mother who makes us better prayers, and she makes our prayers bigger and more perfect. 
And that's the role that Mary plays. Understand this, and the church has known this from the earliest days of the church, the church has recognized the preeminent role that the Blessed Virgin plays. And she's not listed, incidentally, she's not recorded, if you will, very often in Scripture, only about 15 times, and some of those times don't even refer to her by name. But every one of those times, critical points in salvation history. When Christ was, de- when Christ was born, when he was presented in the temple, when he was lost in the temple, when he did his first miracle, at the foot of the cross, Mary is always there at the most important times. It is not an accident. Mary is the first and the greatest of all the saints. She's also the first and the greatest of all the disciples. She was and is the Immaculate Conception. You know, the priest in Lourdes was confused when Mary told Bernadette that she was the Immaculate Conception because he said, no, she's the fruit of the Immaculate Conception. She's not the Immaculate Conception. No, she's the Immaculate Conception. She is as perfect as a human being can be. She still had to be saved by Christ because she's still a creature, but she is the gift to the church. She is the queen of heaven, and she is the mother of us all and the mother of our church. Thank you. I'm getting the high sign. I'm running out of time. Good thing I'm running out of material as well. The point about Mary is this. If Mary is not an important part of your prayer life, she needs to be. She's one of those important aspects of our lives that helps us to become better at who we are, better and closer in our relationship with God, better as Catholics, better as disciples of Christ, better people, better versions of ourselves. Mary is not only guide, but she's mother. She is mother, and she loves us in that way. And we need to recognize that and appreciate it. She doesn't block us from getting to Jesus. She's always standing at the side, pointing in that direction. We wonder sometimes, because we're challenged as Catholics, you know, how can you say Mary is immaculate? And the best answer I've heard is this. Okay. Pretend that you're Jesus and you're going to have a mother. How would you make her? Anything short of perfect? We are blessed in our church to recognize the fact of Mary's unique and powerful role in our faith. Jesus loves her. Jesus took care of her. And Jesus entrusted her to us and us to her. We don't need any more credentials than that. And every prayer we pray, the rosary, the rosary is not a prayer to Mary, it's a prayer through Mary as we reflect on the scriptures. It's all about Jesus. It's always all about Jesus. And Mary, more than anyone else, knows it's always about Jesus. Okay. Let me just tell you that before we close here this evening, we're going to do benediction, so I invite you to stay for that, but before we get there, I would just like to first of all thank each and every one of you for being here, for being here the last three nights, for participating, for doing all the things that you did, for the warm hospitality that you've offered me. It's been wonderful. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful to Sister Sean and to Katie and to Peter and to everybody else at the St. Greg staff who has been so amazing this week as we put this together. We were talking about it at dinner, and Sister said, I can't think of anything that went wrong other than me not turning on the mic. She was absolutely right. And that's because of the great work that the staff here does, and I'm very, very grateful to them for all the work that they did to help make this um, retreat a success. And of course, my, my dear friend, Father Leon, Um, those of you that were here in Advent know my tremendous respect for this man, for what he's done for our family personally, for me, for my mom, for my dad. But I am truly amazed. You know, we talk about mercy. We talk about 
and we talked about it last night. It came up. It was beautiful, right? A whole thing about being aware. And there's nobody who's more aware of somebody who needs mercy, who's suffering, who needs some help than Father Leon. The two stories I told you about my mom and dad um, at, in Advent are just two simple stories about his uncanny ability to recognize and be aware of people who are in need. I told the group this afternoon, I'll tell you as well, uh, my mother-in-law who lives four inches away from me on the other side of the wall, um, <laughs> she's actually a sweet lady, but she uh, is still not forgiven Father Leon for leaving Our Lady of Pompeii. She's not, not happy about that at all. So you are blessed to have him as your pastor. I'm blessed to have him as a, as a dear friend. And I thank you so much for the invitation to be here and for all the, the blessings that you have been personally to Debbie and I and our family and our life. And I, I thank you and, and God's blessings always. So I know that uh, Father would like, to, I actually, I made the huge mistake of saying Father would like to say a few words and I realized who I was talking about. So. Can you believe he really gave it to me? <laughs> what was he thinking? Uh, well, a few words, first of all. And uh, few is a relative term, correct? Few words is a relative term. First of all, I was thinking of a story. And Deacon John doesn't know I know about this, about his life. He doesn't know. He'll tell you it's not about him, but, you know, who are you going to believe, huh? You know? Greg will agree with me, right? He'll agree with me. You know, um, he was talking about the Blessed Mother, and he has a great reverence for our, our Blessed Mother. And when uh, John was a very lo uh, little boy, you know, for Christmas one year, he wanted a, a bicycle. Do you remember that? And uh, he asked his parents for a bicycle for Christmas. And his parents, being very practical, said, well, you know, it's Jesus' birthday. You should really ask Jesus if you should be able to get a bicycle. So he um, pulled one up to his room and sat at his desk and pulled out a piece of paper and started to write a letter to Jesus. Uh, Dear Jesus, you know, my name is John, and I'd like a bicycle for your birthday, and you're going to give that to me uh, because I'm always very kind to my brother. Right? Right? And uh, John looked at that for a minute, and he he's kind of scratched his eyes. I, I, I don't think I can write this, you know. So he, he tore that up, threw it out, pulled out a new piece of paper, and he said, you know, dear Jesus, um, my name is John. I'd like a bicycle for your birthday. And uh, you will give this to me because I, I always do everything my parents tell me to do. Huh? We won't ask. <laughs> And he stopped and kind of scratched his head, his looking, he said, I, I, I can't write this either. So uh, he threw that one out, pull, pulled out another piece of paper, and he's sitting there thinking about what he's going to write. And he saw on his dresser a beautiful statue of the Blessed Mother. And so he went over to that statue, and he opened the bottom drawer of his dresser where he had a, an extra towel, and he very carefully wrapped up the statue of the Blessed Mother, very carefully and put it in the bottom drawer. And he went back and he, he started the letter and he said, Dear Jesus, my name is John. I would like a bicycle for your birthday and you will give this to me if you ever want to see your mother again. <laughs> <laughs> he, won't, he won't admit to it, but... <laughs> so... You know, the last three days have been wonderful days, and I, I thought of a story this afternoon, one more, and uh, I, I won't keep it too long, I promise. But um, it was about a pastor, and I'm not sure I shared this here at, at St. Greg's. It was a, a new pastor came to his parish, 
and the people were anxious to meet him, you know. And it was the first Sunday, and he uh, began Mass and eventually went to the pulpit, read the Gospel, and, and uh, began the homily. People were anxious. They wanted to know what he was going to say. And he said, love one another. As soon as he said that, he, he sat down. And the people were thrilled because they finally had a priest that got right to the point. You know, they, they were ecstatic. And the second Sunday came, they were very anxious, you know, what he was going to say this week, and, you know, got to the homily, and he said to the people, love one another. And he sat down. They were a little confused. He said, well, you know, it's the same message as last week, but we're getting out early, so, you know, we're not going to question this. And uh, third week, fourth week, fifth week, every single week's exact same homily, love one another. And eventually, somewhere sixth, seventh week, a, a little delegation of the people made an appointment to see the pastor and said, you know, Father, we're very concerned that you're not prepared. You're not prepared for Mass. You're not prepared to teach us our faith. You're not explaining the gospel to us. We're very concerned. And he looked very kind and very lovingly upon them. And, and he said, well, he said, when I see that you have followed my first instruction... I will prepare a second one for you to consider. <laughs> the message is the same often, isn't it? And uh, part of what Deacon John has shared with us is the same of what we've heard before. Love, forgiveness, compassion, mercy. It's a story from the very beginning of recorded time through the Old Testament Forgive, 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 love, 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 mercy, 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 compassion, compassion, compassion. Old Testament and new. And uh, how grateful we are that you shared that continuing message of our Lord with us. And uh, a lot of what Deacon John shared with us and certainly drew out of us both yesterday afternoon and yesterday evening right here uh, was not only the, the same old message, but Beautiful new insights, huh? And if you were here as we shared about the different corporal and spiritual works of mercy, and I, I told him that the one group that I actually helped slightly, he didn't even call upon, you know, but he told me that, uh, that he was overwhelmed with their spiritual insight. I think that's what he called it. <laughs> but, you know, wasn't it marvelous all of the insights that came, huh? And the, the call of ministry, the call of mission, the call of, of mercy, and all of these uh, beautiful ways that we can serve. And so we, we thank you for drawing that out of us, for calling us to be mercy, and to reminding us, uh, especially yesterday, in all these beautiful ways, things that we can very capable of doing, and many of us are doing, to do with a renewed vigor. And we thank you for sharing that. And uh, we thank you for giving your time, your energy, your faith, and your, your great love for our Lord and our Blessed Mother to us. And so, Deacon John, we thank you very much for helping us here. <laughs> Father Tom keeps pointing to his watch, you know. And it's, that's what I was just going to say couple more additional words. See, he's a perfect guy. He, re he keeps me going straight. Uh, we, immediately after our celebration here, there is a, a little reception through the door that's open. We all know where the gathering room is, and if you do not, it's through that door that's open right where I'm pointing. And uh, Rose Spano, who's here, and, and, and she's the, the queen of the reception world here at St. Greg's, always bringing everything together so beautiful. I walked through there, and it's, uh, most of the food is still there. I had to quality control it for you, you know. That's what we do, we sacrifice. But we do invite you, please come and continue that celebration. I'd like to thank Sister and to thank Katie and all those from the parish staff, but particularly Sister and Katie, who really did all of the behind-the-scenes stuff that you don't see. And uh, we've had our teenagers in the back. Uh, Andrew Tyne's back there right now. Joe McGacken was in the back row. He was there Monday and uh, yesterday, Ryan Courtney 
uh, videotaping this and for all the people online who are watching for, for them to be able to see. So we thank one and all. We thank you for being here with us. We thank you all so very much. We do turn to this time of prayer now as Deacon John will lead us in the prayers of benediction. He has given them bread from heaven, having within it all sweetness. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death. May our worship of this sacrifice of your body and blood help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. At this point, I'd like to ask Father Leon to come up and now bless our letters. And someone asked me, will the letters get blessed again? They will before we get them mailed, but as a conclusion for our... You can have the prayer ball, okay? Uh, as a... Um, Conclusion to our, to our uh, retreat tonight, we're going to ask Father if he would kindly bless these. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing upon these letters. We first of all give you praise and thanks for the grace flowing in and through our lives to express those words of forgiveness those words of love, of mercy, of compassion. We ask your blessing upon those who will receive these letters, that they may have that openness of mind and heart, that they may know our sincerity, that they may know the spirit of love, of compassion, of mercy, in which they have been written and offered. We ask you to anoint these letters with the power of your Holy Spirit, to bring renewal and grace upon those who have written them and upon those who will read them. And we ask this, as always, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Let's recite the divine praises. Blessed be God. 